dad first was the first one that actually came to the United States in the early 70s for school. And um, he schooled here, had his whole life, then came back to Nigeria, married my mom, then he had my sister and I. And then things weren't going really well, so he decided to come back to the United States for a better opportunity for myself and my family. And uh, in that, in coming back, at that time he wasn't a citizen of the United States, so it was quite difficult for my sister, my mom, and I to come with him. So we had to stay in Nigeria for a lengthy period of time. And it literally took seven long years, yeah, before I could see my father again. But when it did happen, it came like a miracle. Everything happened really pretty quickly. Like within six months of getting his citizenship, we came to the United States, meeting my dad with nothing. Didn't want a room apartment, working hard, not making enough money to make ends meet. I can still always remember like when we first landed actually, it was a, it was a big shock for me and my sister because me and my sister came first, then my mom came later. He was in the one-room apartment. He was sleeping on the floor. Me and my sister were sleeping on the bed. And then when my mom came, they would both sleep on the floor. We'll sleep on the bed. He'll work. He'll go to work at the gas station, and my mom would go around looking for jobs. My sister would work at the grocery store. My faith was solely, actually, not solely based on what I could see from my mom. I, I mean, that's all I had. So that's all who I could trust and who I could really believe in. And I just could see her reach forgot so much, I would just follow her wherever she said I should go. Without him, as she says all the time, without him, she's no, nowhere to be found. And I have taken that upon myself. Without him, I have nowhere to be found. I won't be as happy as I am today. I won't be as successful as I am today. I won't be me. Like, I wouldn't be, I won't have that joy, that peace. So Sam 23 is, the first, this is why I read it every morning before I leave my home, before I go to work. It was the first Bible chapter, verse, whatever you call it, that I ever learned to read. It was the first one that my parents ever taught me to read. And that's why it's very important to me. We've been in a valley, I've been in a valley with them for a, the majority, majority of my life. And with, even with that, with being in the valley, as the psalm talks about, God is always with you regardless. And that is one thing I could see through my family, through my eyes, through my sister's eyes, through my mom's eyes, through my father's eyes. He's always with you. And that's why I continually read that psalm every single day, because your days are going to be filled with highs and lows. But you just have to trust and know that he's always going to be with you. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Boy, if you can say that in a little one-bedroom apartment with your parents sleeping on the floor because they want the only bed there to be shared with their kids so the kids could at least have a place to sleep on a bed. And you can say in that moment, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Then you can say it any time. What is the point where enough becomes enough? What is the point where we can say and mean it, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I'm okay. I'm good. I'm all right. Don't worry. I'm provided for. Do we believe that? Do we live in that? And, and I believe that followers of Jesus Christ need to live in that place where we understand that the Lord is our shepherd and because of that, we lack nothing. I want to give you a recognition and I want to ask you to, in your mind to try to recognize this. And some of you might say, I get it, I agree. Some of you might say, I don't recognize that as my reality. But I think it is for, if not for all of us, for most of us, 
This is what I want us to recognize. Recognition, God has been good, and I have a lot of stuff. God has been good, and I have a lot of stuff. You want to try that with me? God has been good, and I have a lot of stuff. Uh, We live in a stuff world. We live in a more, more, more world. We live in a bigger, better, upgrade kind of a world. And, And we have to recognize this, that God has been good. Listen to these words from Psalm 23. We finished a series on Psalms last week, and we're in a new series on enough, but there's an overlap here with Psalm 23. Psalm 23, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That just sounds good, doesn't it? He leads me beside quiet waters. You get the picture. Verse 5 says this. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies, God provides. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. That you anoint my head with oil may not make sense in our culture, but in those days, there was a sense of the presence of God's goodness and the presence of God's spirit and God's blessing where they would actually put oil on someone's head or even kind of a a little, little, uh, almost like a little bit of lard kind of a thing, which sounds kind of gross to us, where they put this, this, this clump of coagulated oil that would kind of melt through the day and run down your face. And that was a good thing. You're like, it's just this picture of God's blessing. And then the picture, the last picture that we can get, my cup overflows. You know, are you a cup half empty or a cup full person? Oh, I'm neither. I'm a cup overflows person. I don't see it half half empty. I don't see it half full. I don't see it just full. My cup overflows. God is good. And I have a lot of stuff. Not just spiritual goodness, but I have lots of stuff from this world's standpoint. But the problem is I I get kind of stuck in the world I live in. I get stuck in my limited space. And so I look at myself and I look at my life and I look and I say, well, I don't have as much stuff as she's got. (laughs) I don't got as much stuff as he has. And, and, and when we look at ourselves and our world around us, and, and, and we, live in, you know, we live in Seaside and Salinas and Pacific Grove and Marina, we live all around an area where there's lots of stuff. And we might even look and say, well, when I compare myself to somebody else, it doesn't look like I have a lot of stuff. But, but God has to give us those moments where we get the right picture. And for me, those moments come when I go to El Salvador. Shoreline Church supports a whole region of El Salvador in La Libertad area. And in that area, there are children who many people in our church support. And so little Juan Francisco and Andrea are children that my wife and I interact with and we write letters to and we, I've got a chance to meet both of them. But when I get to be in El Salvador, I get a perspective that makes me say, God is good, I have a lot of stuff. Here, here's a number that has been impacted by that perspective. The number is $11.50. Two fives are one and two quarters, $11.50. This number sticks in my heart because this is the average income of a family in that area of El Salvador where these children that we care for and love and pray for live. That's the average family income. That means that the average person each day, the average person has, gets $2.87 to live on. Now suppose I said to you, hey listen, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going wild here. I'm giving you right now $11.50. Just go do whatever you want. Go crazy, have some fun. I mean, just, just go nuts. Just spend like you're crazy. You know, say, well, $11, I, I, okay, I can get a coffee and maybe a roll. And I'm out of money, right? That's, that's our perspective. But when I go down to El Salvador, and when I walk into someone's house, when I say a house, it's not big enough to be a garage here. When I say house, um, you, you could, it's not big enough to park your car in. It's, it's, it's one room. All, all these families, it's the same thing. There's no, there's no running water. There's no power. It's just you know, stone walls, or brick walls. If there's a bathroom outside, it's, it's a, it's a, it's not a, there's no running water. It's just a different world. And, and, and then the first time I was there, it struck me when one of the children wanted to show us some of their stuff. Uh, they had stuff too. They went underneath the, the one bed where the three kids slept, and then there was a bed where the dad and mom slept, and it's just one room. It's not rooms. It's just one, the whole house is one room. And this one little, little girl pulled out from underneath her bed her box, and she had every possession that she treasured in her life in that box. That was her life. That was, that was, her, that was her box of stuff. And she shared things with us. And I say, God has been good, and I have a lot of stuff. <laughs> I just do. And, and, and I, I can go back to when Sherry and I first got married. And we, and we 
you know, we could look, so we didn't have much then. First, the first year we were married, uh, my guy who did taxes for me uh, said, uh, oh, you're, you're below the poverty line. I said, really? I didn't know I was. And he said, oh, yeah, you're way below the poverty line. The next year I said, am I still below the poverty line? He said, yeah, I'm still below the poverty line. Year three, how are we doing? Still below the poverty line. Year four, we crossed the poverty line. We're like, woo! Um, but you know what? Those first three years, we didn't know we were poor. And you know what? I could, I could say then, God is good. And I could say then, we got a lot of stuff. <laughs> Still has, that, that, that's just the reality. So, so we need to think about this, and we need to get this heavenly perspective. You know, we look at the people around us and compare ourselves, but if you look from God's perspective on the whole world, God has been good, and we have a lot of stuff. That's the recognition. Second thing, a proclamation. I want to invite you to think about making this a personal proclamation in your life. And here it is. I have enough. More stuff won't make me more happy. Should we try that together? I have enough. More stuff won't make me more happy. I wish we believed that. I wish we did. Because we have this sense as we go through life that, okay, I'm close. Man, I'm, it's right there. If I, if I can just get that, if I can just accomplish that, if I can just get, if I'm there, then I'll be content. Then I'll be happy, right? Problem is when I get here, oh, oh, there's the next thing. There's, the next, there's always the next thing. And, and, and so if, if we can learn to say, I have enough, more stuff won't make, make me more happy, and we believe it, we move to this place of, of joy and contentment, not based on how much we have, but based on who has us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you say, I belong to Jesus. I have everything I really, truly need. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Listen to these words from Philippians chapter 4. The apostle Paul is, is reflecting on his life. He's talking to people who have actually brought him a gift. They've shown concern for him by bringing a gift to help him with his ministry because he was struggling financially. So he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. This is Philippians chapter four, beginning verse 10. He says, you renewed your concern, meaning you were able to give to me and help with my ministry. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. You couldn't give then, but now you've just been able to give a little bit and help my ministry. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned, listen closely, I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances. Whoa. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've been in both places. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, I've experienced both, he says. Whether living in plenty or in want, I've been in both places. And here's the key, verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's about who gives you strength. It's about knowing Jesus. Because when you come to the cross, and when you receive Jesus' grace, when you confess your sins, and you receive the, the gift of Jesus, not only are your sins washed away, but God moves into you by his Holy Spirit. And the Bible says every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms becomes ours. And on top of that, God gives us a lot of stuff. God provides in amazing, staggering, beautiful ways for us. We just don't notice it a lot of times as we're looking at what other people have. But God has been good. So can you proclaim, I have enough. More stuff won't make me more happy. That's a scary thing to say, I'm good. But can I tell you something? It's not about laziness. If you want the best life, the greatest joy, the deepest happiness and the most meaning in your life, you will learn contentment right where you are right now. You'll learn to say, I have enough, and more stuff won't make me more happy. Because when you decide to be content where you are right now, you'll be content. But if, you, if your mindset is this, I will be content, and I will be happy once I have fill in the blank. That car, this car, that experience, whatever it is, once I have that, that amount of money, that amount of money saved, then I'll be content and happy, then it's always going to be one step away. But when you learn to be content now, it's powerful. Because if you're content where you are right now, guess what? If God happens to give you more, you'll still be content. And if you're content with what you have right now and God chooses to give you less, you'll still be content. Why? Because your contentment's not based on how much you have. But it's based on knowing Jesus. Our first three years of marriage, I didn't, I, I didn't feel poor. I didn't feel like we lived below the poverty line. I felt like we had everything we needed. I had a wife who loved me. And we didn't, we didn't know how we were going to pay for lots of stuff. When we got married, um, 
we, the first thing we bought together as a couple was a bed because I had a, like, a little, like a little kid single bed because I never had cause or need for anything larger. And Sherry had like a little kid single bed. And I'm going to date myself right here, but we weren't, going to go, we weren't going to go, I love Lucy, Ricky, and Lucy Ricardo with two single beds and a nightstand between them. I don't even know how that works, you know. Uh, you know we weren't going to do that. We wanted actually a bed big enough for us to, to sleep in together because we were married. And so we actually bought a bed. And I think for three or four years, we paid about $15 a month because we couldn't afford a bed. But, but we had everything. And 33 years later, we still have everything. Now we have two little separate beds. No, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that in the first service. It just struck me. Wouldn't that be funny? But it's not true. Uh, that's not true at all. Um, back to this sermon. Okay. <laughs> but, but to be able to say, I have enough, more stuff won't make me more. And but to believe that, to know that is freeing and powerful. And then the third thing, transformation. I want to talk about living an enough lifestyle. I want to challenge you and invite you to say, I want to live a lifestyle that is an enough lifestyle. Where I say on a regular basis, I'm fine. I have enough. I'm good. And you will find the power of God, the joy of the Holy Spirit, peace like you've never experienced before, and purpose and freedom if you can capture this. So how do I get to that place of living in an enough lifestyle? If you're a note taker, write these down. There's a place in your bulletin. Write these four things down and just try these four things and see if this doesn't just set your life free and do amazing things in your soul. How do I live in enough lifestyle? Number one, an intentional and regular, intentional and regular expressions of thankfulness. Make a decision that you will be thankful. For what? For everything. I got these shoes, and they got holes in them. But I got shoes, thank you, Jesus. I got this car, and it breaks down quite regularly, but I got a car, thank you, Jesus. I got a car, and it's fast and beautiful and shiny, thank you, Jesus. Whatever, whatever it is, thank you, Jesus. And, and let me suggest this, that you thank God regularly. God, thank you. I acknowledge that every gift, good gift I have is from you, You've been so good to me. I have a lot of stuff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank God. Second, be thankful in front of other people. When you're under the people, say, I'm so thankful for what I have. I'm so thankful for my apartment. I'm so thankful for, and people might go, what, you're thankful for that? Oh man, I'm incredibly thankful. Whatever it is, be thankful and express that. Tell other people, and actually say to people, I, I'm so content and I'm so thankful. And let that be the message of your life. Thank God, thank other people, let other people know you're thankful, and then listen closely. Be thankful in your own soul. Just go through your day. Say, man, I'm so thankful for this. Lord, th you get up in the morning, you open your closet, and say, Lord, thank you. That, that there's a lot of people in the world that have one or two sets of clothes to choose from. I've got eight, 10, 12, 30, what do you, <laughs> keep going, right? God, thank you, Lord. We often look at what we don't have and kind of in our own hearts kind of gripe and, and say, I'm gonna just be relentlessly thankful to God, in front of others, and just in my own soul. I'm just going to be a thankful machine and lift up praise to God. Listen to these words from Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Fills the hungry with good things. Now you might hear those words from Psalm 107. And you might say, oh yeah, well that's the person that's going through easy times. They don't understand my life. Well, listen to what comes right before that. Because in this psalm, before it talks about how God provides and how thankful they are, we read this about the people that are responding with thankfulness. Verse four of Psalm 107. Some wandered in desert wastelands. This is the people that are being thankful. Some people wandered in desert wastelands, finding no, no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty. Their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. These aren't people that are going through easy times. They've gone through a tough time. But there's this commitment to thankfulness. If you want to live in enough lifestyle, make a commitment to be, to be just relentlessly thankful. I love the video we saw this morning with Luca talking about his family. I love that we have people at Shoreline that are part of every walk of life. And to hear somebody say, you know, I, when I would go to bed at night sharing a small bed with my sister because that's all we had and my parents were sleeping on the floor. But we were thankful to God. Be thankful where you are right now. Not, not when, you, when you get there. Be thankful here. And you'll be thankful when you get there or if you don't get there, you'll still be thankful. So number one, 
living in enough lifestyle, intentional and regular expressions of thankfulness. Number two, developing the skill of controlling my eyes. You need to develop the skill, the ability to control your eyes and what you look at. If you want to live in enough lifestyle, you're going to have to learn to control what you're looking at and how your eyes work. And, and so I wanna, I've got a couple of boxes here, and I want to just give you a picture of what this could look like. And so if this box here is sort of a picture of my life, and I'm sitting here, and, I kinda, and I'm looking at my life, and I'm, and I'm looking at the stuff I have, not just my whole life, but kind of things, right? And I say, well, what I got in my box? Well, I got some, I got some tennis shoes. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not new. They're not fancy, but they don't have holes in the bottom, and they work. So I go, say, Lord, thank you. you know, that, that's something you, you provided for me. And you say, I've got a, I got a golf driver. It's about nine or ten years old, but if I know how to swing the club, it'll still go straight, Right? But it's, it's not the newest, but it, it, it works. It's like, Lord, thank, thank you for that. Um, you say, okay, I got a car. And this one's got a little logo, a little Hyundai logo. My first three cars were Hyundais. You know why I got Hyundais? You know what their motto was when they started? Inexpensive and built to stay that way. Did I mention we were broke? And so I drove, I drove three different Hyundais through, through over about 15 or 20 years. And you know, but, but, but God, that, that's my car, great. I've got, I've got a computer here. Now, it's not the newest, it's not the latest, it's not the best, but I open it, it works, and I can, I can do my work with it. I got this little purse. You want to talk about a classic? Look at this purse. Ladies, you're going to love that purse right there. They don't make purses that color green anymore, do they? And you can say, but, but Lord, but I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. I got the Super Nintendo game system. Now, some of you are like, I'll buy that right now for $1,000. That's a classic. Well, you know, if you, you, go, you go, where did you get that, man? That's... Okay, but that's, uh, you know, and you go, that's from like the 1840s, right? Um, but you, you go, okay, and I, and I look at it and say, God... I, you've been good. God, I'm thankful. I'm content. You're so good, Lord. Thank you. Uh, uh. Then I start looking at somebody else's box. And then you notice their box is fancier <laughs> and a little bigger. So what, what do you got over here in your box? What do you got in here? And I started going over here. Well, they got a key, too, for their car. But this doesn't have the Hyundai logo. This has the Mercedes logo. Oh. And I'm like, oh. And all of a sudden... My box isn't looking so good anymore. Why? Because I'm looking in their box. And they go, well, I got, oh, the, the M2. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Mm, come on. You know, the, 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 new, the newest. The, and, you know, this goes 40, 50 yards further, even if you swing the same, because it's magic. And it's new and it's shiny. You know, so I can, I, and I got that. You know, and, they, and you look in there, and they go, okay, they, they got a bag that says coach with a bag that says coach. And all of a sudden, my little green purse isn't looking so slick anymore, right? You know, I'm going, I'm going I, want, I want one of those, you know? And then, then shoes. Valentino Gar, Garavani, maybe? Uh, I'm not wearing I'm not putting them on, but they're beautiful, aren't they? You know, and I go, okay, they got, they got shoes. And then they got, oh, they got a, their computer. It has a shiny computer with a little apple glowing on it. And then they got the PlayStation. Some of you say, well, I'll take the Nintendo. But they got the Play. You got, so they got all the new stuff. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. If I live here and I'm just looking at what I have, I'm thankful. I start looking at what you have. And all of a sudden, oh, I got a box full of garbage. <laughs> you know, or I can start looking at somebody else's box. It's smaller. And I go, oh, look, I'm better than that. Look at my, I'm better than them. What a life. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm great. You know, it sort of depends on what I'm looking at. That's, but that's the danger. And so I want to give a suggestion about our eyes. If you want to become an enough person, somebody who really lives a life that, that expresses, I truly believe, I'm thankful for what I have, I'm satisfied, I have enough. Uh, I want to suggest our eyes, and there's, there's three different ways we can kind of focus our eyes. First one is this, I can focus on their stuff. I can spend my life focusing on what other people have, and I will be discontent my whole life. I can have my eyes focusing on what I have, what's in my box, what I have. And you say, well, then I can, I can grow in contentment and I can say, okay, I just keep my eyes off their stuff and keep it here. But there's a third option. And that is having your eyes fixed on the hands of God. The God who loves you. The God who has been so good to say, I give to you freely out of my love and my grace. And if I keep my eyes fixed on God, I look at the throne of God and I see Jesus with his hands lifted up, extended with nail prints where he died on the cross for me. I say, oh, I'm thankful Jesus who gives me every good and perfect gift and I'm thankful. So I think more than just focusing on someone else's stuff or even my own stuff, we look at the giver and say, God, you've been good. You've been gracious. You've been generous. 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world 
and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Will you, would you say, God, I want to control my eyes. And when you find yourself peeking at everybody else's stuff or even focus, fixating on your stuff, say, let me look at the giver and become thankful. Number three, relentlessly saying the word enough. Actually, use that word regularly in your vocabulary. Enough, I'm good, no thanks, don't need any more. Now, it used to be that, you know, that, that there was you know, marketing experts that would have to get you, you know, to a store to look at a billboard to say, hey, what you have is no good, get the new thing. Now, if you've bought anything online, they're now, they, they have algorithms and they have programs to figure out what you need. And then an email comes to you and says, oh, by the way, you got this six months ago, now you need this. I do? Oh, I didn't even know I needed it. Okay, and uh, there's like systems now that are they're telling us, don't be content with what you have. Don't, be, don't feel like you have enough. There's always something more. And so we have to make a decision. I'm, I'm going to be relentlessly committed to saying enough. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to put a lid on my box. I'm going to actually say, okay, God, you've been so good. I'm thankful for what I have. And God, I'm going to just put a lid here and say, God, I don't need any more. I'm good. And if God says, hey, listen, I'm going to lift up the corner of your lid and throw some more stuff in there. Thank you, Jesus. But, but I'm not going to say, I got to have more. I'm going to say, I'm good. When Sherry and I lived in Michigan, we had a point years ago where we looked at our life and we said, we have enough. We're good. And we put a lid on our, on our lifestyle. We said, we're not going to upgrade anymore. We're good. And we stayed there. And if God, when God, gave, and if God gave us more, and God did give us more, we said, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do with it? Because we know it's not more stuff for us because we're good. We put a, we put a lid on it. Then God called us to California. And we had to kind of change a little bit because, you know. But, but you know what? A few years ago, we hit that point again. And, and it's, we don't live in the same kind of house. We live in, but but we, look, we said, we're good. We're good where we are. We don't need to keep, and, and that's been so freeing and so empowering to be able to say, we're good, we're content, we have enough. I love these words in 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10 says this. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Boy, that's pretty severe. <laughs> but it's just mean if they're just consumed with the more and more. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There, there's people who have been so consumed with the more, more that they've actually wandered from Jesus. And so we've got to be aware and be careful and be on our guard. The, the, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. When we become consumed with consuming and in love with loving more and more. But if we can come to a place where we say, I'm, I'm good, I have enough, and declare that and mean it, it frees us in many, many ways. And then the fourth thing, if you want to learn to live in enough lifestyle, nurturing and growing a generous heart and lifestyle. Say, God, make me a generous person. Let me not hold on to things tightly, but hold on to things loosely and become more and more generous. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11 says this. Now he who supplies, this is God, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. It's both stuff and godliness that God is growing within you. You will be enriched in every way. Listen to this. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous. How often? On every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That you would grow in generosity. If you want to live an enough lifestyle, make a commitment. I will grow in generosity. Make that, make, that, make that a goal of your life and a commitment of your soul. And that is freeing. So I want to give you two challenges to really pray about. The first one is what I want to call a 30-day challenge. And I want, to, I want to challenge you actually to write on a couple post-it notes, 30-day challenge. And post it like on your door when you go outside, when you're going to leave your house. If you have an office on your office or somewhere where you're going out or coming in where you see it. For 30 days, 30-day challenge. And if somebody says, what does that mean? You can tell them. And here's the 30-day challenge. Brace yourselves. Give something away every day for the next 30 days. Give something away. Some of you are going to get excited. You're going to try this. You say, well, like, what, like, what, what am I going to give away? I don't know. But I know this. God is good. And you got a lot of stuff. And so do I. I love books. But I got a feeling some books are going to be given away in the next, I'm going to do this for the next 30 days. I invite you on this journey. Some of you, God, you just every day say, God, what's something I could give away? God, it may be a very small thing. It may be something you give to a friend. 
It may be something you say, God puts in your heart, sell it and give it to some mission project, give it to, to Global Outreach at Shoreline Church, or give it to something that'll help somebody in need. But every day, for 30 days, some of you say, well, I don't have a lot of stuff. You'll be amazed if you walk around and say, Lord, what could I give away? It might be something you start putting in a box somewhere and bring to Salvation Army at the end of the month. It, it, might, be, it might be food. For, we're going to do a food and clothing drive the third week of this series when we talk enough to share. I'm hoping every single person who's part of Shoreline puts aside a box of stuff to share. Food and clothes. Because there's people who come here every week, year round. Thousands of people every year that we help. And you have stuff that's just sitting there that God could use to bless someone else. So every day for 30 days, 30 day challenge, give something. And you might get the end of 30 days and go, I can do this for 10 more years and still have too much stuff. If that's you, then just keep on doing it. All right? 30 day challenge. Second thing, weekly challenge for the next four weeks. Here's my weekly challenge for you. Give something to your local church every week for the next four weeks. If you're visiting from another church, go back home and give it to your church. Don't give it here, give it there. But if you're part of Shoreline, every week for four weeks, give something. Whether you do it, I, I did for the first time, I texted a gift to Shoreline. I knew that we're gonna be replacing our carpet and you know what, this carpet, I've had enough of it. Um, it's, it we're beyond needing new carpet. This is, not, this is not an opulent thing. This is just a disgust and functionality thing. Uh, don't look too closely at it. But, we, you know, but, but I, want to be, I want to give one of the first gifts toward that. And so I said, how do I give a gift? You, I never used the Shoreline's texting thing. So I got, I, it took me like a minute. I loaded it in, did it, and I sent a gift. And so, but every week for four weeks, Give something to the work of your church and pray. And, and whether you give online, whether you give by texting, whether you put in the offering plate and say, Lord, I give because you've been good to me. Use this for your glory. Every week for four weeks, try that. Some of you are gonna go, I've never done this before. This is amazing. And you're gonna find incredible joy and freedom and you're gonna keep doing it. But I, I challenge you to grow in generosity. In a more and more world, can we learn to be enough people? We live in a more, more, more world. And God says, be content. Not, not, not when I get there, not when I get that, not when I finally accomplish this. And, and listen closely, contentment is not about laziness, not in any way. Contentment is saying, I have God and God has me and I have enough. And if you will pursue this, you will find a joy and a peace and a purpose and a way that God uses you beyond that, beyond that you can imagine a dream right now if you've never tried this. So let's pray and ask God to, to challenge our hearts to do something that seems counterculture and, and almost counter to our thinking but so glorifying to God. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have been good to us. You gave your life on the cross. You gave us everything. You've blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And then, Lord, you've just given us stuff. You've given us things and, and, and different places, different levels of life in this room. But, Lord, all of us can say you've been good. So will you grow our generosity? Will you grow our hearts and our capacity to be generous? Will you grow our contentment? May we say, I have enough. I am thankful. I am good. I am filled with joy. And then, Lord, overflow. Lord, our cup overflows overflow from our lives to others' lives as we learn to grow in generosity.